Hurricane Andrew had a rather humble beginning, being born from a tropical wave over the East Atlantic on August 15, 1992. It struggled to develop until the 22nd, when the system moved into a more favorable environment, which provided warmer sea surface temperatures and lower atmospheric wind shear. For hurricanes to form and intensify, very warm sea surface temperatures are required. Ideally, that's in the mid to upper 80s. This enhances the water vapor near the surface and provides heat and fuel for the storms that form the hurricane. Wind shear is also critical in the formation and intensification of hurricanes, which prefer having very weak wind shear in the atmosphere. That happens when wind speeds don't increase very much when you go from the surface of the water up into the atmosphere. Hurricanes don't like strong wind shear. It disrupts the circulation in the center of the hurricane and can actually kill the cyclone if it's too strong. In 1992, when Hurricane Andrew hit South Florida, I was a graduate student studying meteorology at Colorado State University. And I was getting the chance to work with one of the greats in the field, Dr. Bill Gray, who issues the seasonal hurricane forecasts. Uh, the forecast for that year was actually for a very quiet hurricane season, given that there was an El Nino that was forming in the Pacific Ocean. Uh, little did I know, despite that El Nino, uh, that my parents, my family, would experience one of the worst hurricanes, if not the worst hurricane of their whole life. One of the biggest drivers of weather changes from one year to the next is something we call the El Nino Southern Oscillation. And that's driven by changes in the Pacific Ocean. It has global repercussions. So El Nino is half of the phase. So El Nino is warmer than normal waters in the equator off of Ecuador and Peru in the Pacific Ocean. So it's kind of a remote influence on hurricanes. When we have one of those El Ninos, warmer than normal water, we tend to have fewer hurricanes and usually weaker hurricanes as well. The flip side is the La Nina, or the colder than normal waters off of Ecuador and Peru. It has the opposite effect. We have more hurricanes and sometimes stronger hurricanes during La Nina on average. So in 1992, uh, forecast that Dr. Bill Gray issued and I helped out with was for it to be a quiet year. Forecast was for only four hurricanes and we averaged about six per year. It turned out 1992 overall was a quiet year. There were only four hurricanes. Only one of them was a major hurricane. Problem was that one major hurricane was named Andrew. When it first developed in August 1992, looked like it wasn't going to last very long. It formed east of the Lesser Antilles and uh, it was falling apart. It was getting sheared. So, and that's one of the characteristics of El Nino. It causes more of that wind shear that tears apart storms. And at one point, the National Hurricane Center and Bob Sheets, the director, they were thinking about discontinuing advisories on Andrew. They thought it was, it was, it died basically. But they held on to it for an extra six or 12 hours. And then it started coming back to life. And for a hurricane, uh, if the conditions are hostile, that means there's a lot of wind shear, a lot of dry air, and uh, perhaps cool water. Uh, so Andrew found that little oasis in the midst of a desert of the 1992 hurricane season. And uh, what happened was it got into just a little window where the shear was low, there was a lot of moisture, it was over very warm waters. Just for a few days where the conditions were allowing it to rapidly spin up. By August 23rd, Andrew had grown into a formidable Category 5 hurricane with sustained winds of 160 miles per hour. Moving westward and aiming straight for the east coast of Florida.